Well, so I'm pleased to open this event, this academic seminar on family issues, which is an important part of this World Congress of Families. One of the term that's being used at this meeting and all World Congress meetings is the term natural family. And I've talked in a prior session about the origins of the term natural family, particularly in the uh, work of the, uh, of the development of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But I also want to talk about it in terms of the sciences, the physical and the social sciences. In this sense, being natural, on one hand, means that the family, the natural family, rests within the created order. This means it is open to honest, investigation, fair scrutiny by those who bring the techniques of science to their work. The natural family welcomes scientific inquiry for the confidence of welcoming a friend. Now it is true that during most of the 20th century, the last century, the opinion was widespread that the social sciences were hostile to traditional family relations. As the Swedish economist whom I studied in my doctoral dissertation, Gunnar Myrdal, a social democrat, he underscored the radical nature what he called the radical nature of the social sciences. He insisted that there were no lasting social or economic laws. There were no natural institutions. The whole of human institutional life was a variable. He also said that the attempt to produce social policies that would prevent pathologies from emerging from troubles would lead to what he called a natural marriage of the correct technical and the political, politically radical solution. Social science properly applied to human problems would produce a radical result. And he concluded from this that the social sciences would prove to be subversive of natural human institutions or what had been seen as natural human institutions, such as the family. My argument is that this linkage of radicalism to the social sciences in the 20th century was a profound intellectual error a great mistake. My teacher here has been Robert Nisbet, the American sociologist, who wrote a wonderful book, among many, called The Sociological Imagination. He reminds us that all the great European founders of the discipline of sociology were actually inspired by socially conservative impulses or questions. He looks at figures such as Auguste Comte, Alexis de Tocqueville, Ferdinand Tunis, Frederick Leclerc, Emile Durkheim, Max Weber, <coughs> George Simon, Herbert Spencer. All of them, he argues, found their inspiration, either directly or indirectly, by the anti, from anti-enlightenment thinkers. <clears throat> figures such as Louis de Bonneau, Joseph de Maistre, Chateaubriand, 19th century French thinkers, philosophers, who rejected the extreme views of the Enlightenment and looked to ground human beings within 
communities within society. They were drawn to a new analysis of social order by the great disruptions of the Industrial Revolution and by the excesses of atomistic individualism that developed in the 19th century. According to Robert Nisbet, the very unit ideas of sociology, analysis of family, of community, of tradition, of authority, status, the sacred, alienation, all show, quote, an unusually close relation with the principal tenets of philosophical conservatism. Nisbet concludes, the creative paradox of sociology lies in the fact that although it falls in its objectives and in the political and scientific values of its principal figures in the mainstream of modernism, its essential concepts and its implicit perspectives place it much closer to philosophical conservatism. Accordingly, as one who affirms the natural family, through religious faith, and through a study of history, also expects that social science, when done well, and when done honestly, will reveal the necessary irreplaceable position of the natural family. For example, one of the most important findings of the social sciences over the last four or five decades has been irrefutable proofs, proof. Thousands upon thousands of research results showing that in terms of child well-being and of social well-being, it is children who live and grow with their two natural biological parents in a married couple home, who are most likely to grow into healthy, productive, happy citizens of society. And then any deviation from this model, be it through cohabitation, be it through adoption, be it through divorce, be it through out-of-wedlock births, be it through remarriage or even same-sex marriage, all raise the probability of negative outcomes. Again, this is in line with what I think what we call the conservative nature of authentic and honest social science.